before us private funding of legal services in the Cayman Islands. Mr. Speaker, I have been a champion of such from the life before politics. My life before politics. I recall quite specifically two occasions in which this was a subject of discussion between myself and the Premier, then Alden McLaughlin, the attorney, wherein I petitioned him to, this is before politics, Mr. Speaker, wherein I petitioned him to assist someone with that, with this, what this will correct. And he said, as lawyers, they couldn't do it. Of course, I, that started a very heated argument between him and I. And, and, and I told him, we, we have to be creative in how we do it. But of course, he was fearful of being disbarred when the law prevented it. And then he was fearful of the possibility of, of looking at striped stars for a while. So that is in Northwood. When you look through the bars, you see striped stars. Uh, oh, possibility, yes. Um, and then on another occasion, I retained him and I had to pay him a dollar because he said I needed to pay him a dollar. It was on the spur of the moment. I'm sure he will recall that one specifically. Um, one night we were out on our social haunts. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, um, that means it has been around in my mind for a long time because of the lack of justice um, for many in this country. Mr. Speaker, we have heard so often of the rich prolonging these things, especially if they know they're in fault. They're at fault and break the other person. I've seen it. I recall a friend of mine who had a very good case against an accountant. And because the accountant was of such means that he could hire the best. It exhausted my friend's resources and he had to bow out. Thus, that person took my friend's property not only his property, but his family home. And today, that accountant has more than many or all of us put together in here and live in close to a hundred million dollar house. But be that as it may, there, was, there were no provisions in this country for that at the time, so that the other lawyers could, from the other side, could um, continue to fight 
because my friend being their client had to come up with the monies. Suffice it to say, Mr. Speaker, the children of that man has no assets now. All of their family assets has gone. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Premier, the Attorney General in his presentation of this bill, I think he said, justice has been out of the reach of many for many years, something to that effect. But Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, this is not the only place that justice has been out of the reach of many for many years. There are the areas as well. Now, I'm just glad that we are trying to correct this, this one. I guess better late than never. But my little story of how I came into play with this was more than 20 years ago and the premier the attorney general said in 2000 and 2 was when it first emerged in the courts to a degree where it warranted attention by the by the by the by the the judges and then did not complete until 2012. That's 10 years later, and now we are bringing it eight years later. So that's 18 years. It has been languishing somewhere out there. And I understand what the city, the wheels of justice grind slow, but the grind all might is fine. I understand how, how long it takes for, the, for those wheels to reach one full cycle, but still this has been languishing, I believe, a little too long. Mr. Speaker, my, despite my support for this, I fear that this is going to create another creature wherein there are certain lawyers in this country who will press the envelope, so to speak, with this, in that everyone that comes before them to look representation, instead of being honest with them, they will take up the cause and they will be in the court look and relief. The good thing about it is that now they'll have to work much harder than they were doing before. And I can think of at least one who thinks he's the guru on everyone's rights <laughs> and makes his public pronunciations of, of such. But that's just not to say that that's any reason for us not to do it, because I'm sure others will benefit as a result. Now, Mr. Speaker, there are a few things that I, I'm sure the Attorney General will explain to me. He knows how inquisitive I am and, and how much I review these things and come up with, with, the, with questions that are, are unresolved in my mind as a result of my reviews. Now, he said that on the Section 3 of the bill, that an attorney at law shall not enter into any contingency, 3-2, 
for a fee agreement if the attorney at law is retained in respect of a proceeding under the penal code or any other criminal or quasi criminal proceedings. I wonder if the, Mr. Speaker, if the Premier can. The, I wonder if the Attorney General can explain to us in instances where, and he referred to a traffic offense, in instances where a person sues an insurance as a result of a traffic offense, would that be a civil suit against the insurance? Pardon me? That would be covered. Because that came as a result of a traffic offense, which is a, is a criminal or quasi-criminal proceeding. It would be a negligence claim, but that's criminal too. No, it's not. Civil, civil negligence. But, but resulting, so what happens when the person who caused the accident uh, defends that or counters that and looks for cause? It was caused by that vehicle, vehicle, traffic, traffic, offense. Could that person then go into an agreement to recover costs from the petitioner? That is where I am, I'm concerned that, and it may be there's some, some, explanation for that. The other one is on four, where is there's a child in, in um, matrimonial financial disputes. Now, Mr. Speaker, I wonder if that cannot be separated in that there are prescribed provisions for maintenance and uh, in matrimonial disputes. But then there are those who have much means which could be separated. And if that, the person who is without are not within with sufficient financial resources to fight it, would that not be one that could be carved out and differentiated? Because I don't want to take anything away from the children or child, or whichever. But then if that person could go into an agreement for their lawyers on contingency to fight for property. Particularly the ones that are hidden or get hidden afterwards. And, and this goes, this is, I guess, unisex. It's whether it's the, the wife or the Whichever, let's, let's, let's use the word partner. Eh? Whichever partner has the means and the other one walks away with mere child support. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if there could, if there is a way to differentiate those two things.
and then I'm sure the, the, the Attorney General has gotten that one. Mr. Speaker, the other one I want the Attorney General to explain in his wind up is he talked about this 33 and a third percent prescribed. Is that intended to be placed in the regulations? Because what I'm seeing here is that in four, they the success fee should not exceed the normal fees of an attorney by more than 100%. Now he explained that if a, an attorney is $900, they could make, that is per hour, that success fee could look at $1,800 an hour. I don't know how we gotta protect them at $900 an hour, then you're telling them you can go to 1800 And with that 33%, I, I, I don't think, at least I didn't, and for the benefit of this Honorable House, the Attorney General needs to tie all those in for us as to how it's going to work. Because later on in the bill, In, in that four, four, six, six, I believe it is, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> it says the grand court in determining an application under subsection four shall not approve a contingency fee which, which exceeds 40% of the total amount awarded of any amount obtained by the client or of the value of any property recovered in the action or proceedings. However, the amount or property Pardon me? Plus six, um, um, five, five, four, six. Four says, notwithstanding subsection one, two, and three, an attorney at law may enter into a contingency fee agreement where A, the amount paid to the attorney at law is more than the prescribed maximum percentage of the amount of the value of the property recovered in the action or proceeding or the success fee exceeds either the percentage set, set out in subsection one or two. And one of those are the 100%, one is a prescribed, prescribed by regulations. And then we talk about the 40%. At the very least, it's confusing because then Ms. The, the, the Attorney General introduced another percentage, which is 33 and a third. Yet, the lawyer can get up to 100% of his daily hourly fee. At the very least, that is confusing to me when it comes to these numbers. As to where is this prescribed to the three and a third and the four percent that's in regulation will be prescribed in regulations. But I don't know that. I mean, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Speaker, the Attorney General is saying that will be the percentage they use in the regulations. But the regulations are not in front of us. 
I, 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 I understand that the cabinet can make regulations, but when we say prescribed fee, and then we have the tax in thereof, and then and the, the courts are going to do the taxing because the courts are now the regulator of these agreements, may I say? Um, I, I believe this was written, I don't know if it was written for the lawyers, but I can tell you we spoke recently about the mistrust amongst them. But more importantly, the, another set of confuse, confusion that will cause further mistrust between them and, and their, their clients is not going to make us any better off. I trust that the Attorney General understood what I was trying to get across there, Mr. Speaker, with, with regards to the confusion all those numbers have created. And I'm sure he is capable of... Exp Mr. Speaker, he doesn't need more about 20 fees that them lawyers prescribe, put on you. See what I tell you? You see what I tell you? If you don't have it in clear black and white, it's an opportunity for them to confuse. They would confuse Einstein. To their uplift, I should say. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I would like the AG to at least help us in that regard. The other one is, Mr. Speaker, if I may move on, in regulations. It says the cabinet, this is clause 19, it says the cabinet, after consultation with the Chief Justice, and the legal association. I want to pay particular attention to the last entity that we talked about there. The legal association. Are we are we saying that there aren't associations? You see why I stay up late at night when my brain is young and fresh? I get up early in the morning at four o'clock and do it. And my mind is clear and I look at their reward. I wonder what's the purpose of the association? Are we recognizing cell phone then? Oh yeah? So what about the other duly registered one, Alpha? Or any other legal association that has the constitutional right to register as lawyers, as associates. Are, 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 are we jettisoning them or are we not going to recognize I'm politicking? Oh, point taken. I thought you said I was politicking because this is where we, we resolve all the politics, you know. This is not the place that has a steeple 
on the top. This is the place where we resolve the politics, Mr. Speaker. And all of these matters are politics. Oh, I, 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 I misunderstood you. I do apologize, Mr. A.G. Oh, I thought you, you, you said, because that's a, 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 a a common thing to be said in here that I'm playing politics. I, I was elected on the, in, on the 8th of November 2000 and that's what he asked me to do. No, 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 you can't. You want to get a point of order? Get up. Get up, Mr. Prospect Man. Get up. You want a point of order? Go ahead. Make sure you know what you're doing though. I promise you that. Mr. Prospect, go ahead, sir. He wants me to give it? You can't be directing the speaker. You were. You were asking the speaker, where am I going with this? You have no right, neither do I, to direct the speaker. No one in here. Not even the premier can direct the speaker. Yeah, but it, people need to learn this thing, Mr. Speaker. And if you don't know, zip it. Come on. You and I have gone much, come much further than that. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I ain't gonna get in that with the member from Prospect because he gonna be a loser on that one. I can assure him of that. Um, Mr. Speaker, and I don't want to do that because he and I have gone too far beyond that now, okay? Mr. Speaker, if the like I said, Mr. Speaker, I support the bill and its, its intent, but I, I, I would prefer if the, pre the Attorney General could, could give us some indication of, of those points. And Mr. Speaker, there may be some, 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 some simple explanation for it, which I haven't seen, or which I know nothing of. And I trust that the Attorney General can enlighten me, so to speak, and thus it will enlighten the rest of the members of this honorable house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Last call, the... Honorable Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the member from Newlands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will be brief because I do believe all the important points have been covered so far, but I... I wanted to, to rise to give my support to this bill as well. Um, it is, I think, timely legislation that is being brought because as referred to by the member from Georgetown Central, um, it, it does go a long way in enhancing and, and affording people access to justice in this country. Mr. Speaker, I can think of many, many examples where people have felt somewhat short-changed at the outcome of a court proceeding because they have been unable to take things to the extent that they could have had they been able to afford um, proper representation, and, and, or not just proper representation, but the ability for the, that representation to go to the, the maximum that it should have. So I am I'm pleased to see that this is now being done. I think a great many people in this country will benefit 
from this. And Mr. Speaker, while I, I hear some of the concerns about um, frivolous lawsuits and individuals being encouraged to pursue lawsuits just for the sake of pursuing them, um, I did set my mind at ease because that was a concern as, of mine as well. But I think that there, there is a self-balancing mechanism here that will eliminate that because before entering into one of these agreements, an attorney is going to consider and weigh the possibility of success. If there's a low degree of su possible success, I don't think any right-thinking attorney is going to enter into one of these agreements because they lose in the, in the long run. So I think that balances itself out, Mr. Speaker, um, and, and alleviates some of that concern about you know, people just filing endless lawsuits in court uh, based on these contingency agreements. Mr. Speaker, I, um, in thinking back to what I was saying earlier about access to justice, there's also, I think, some gray area that this legislation will clear up. Um, I'm thinking of one example that came to my attention recently where an individual con you know, em employed a, an attorney to deal with a, a settlement. Um, that individual had been paying the attorney legal fees, but when the settlement came in, that individual was told that the, the settlement was going to be used to pay for some of those legal fees, which she was unaware of. So again, that to me is extremely unethical for an attorney to do, and I don't think it is, it is an indictment on the, the legal profession here. I think it, that, that's an extreme example However, those cases do come up from time to time. Having this legislation is going to make the rules extremely clear, abundantly clear, what can and cannot be done, what agreements can be entered into, um, and of course, requiring the client to agree to these sorts of arrangements. Um, an attorney shouldn't make an assumption on behalf of their client when it comes to payment of fees. So I am um, pleased to see that we're we're going to eliminate some of those gray areas that some people may have taken liberties with in the past. So, Speaker, I, I did have questions on just two. So actually, sorry, just one, one section, in the, um, and that was on section 19. And I'm hoping that in his wind up, the Honorable Attorney General can exp just, just give a, some clarity on why this is needed. But in, um, Section 19.2D, clear that there's a very, there's a clause there that, that allows exemption from the regulation. It says exempt persons, actions or proceedings or classes of persons, actions or proceedings from this law, regulations made under this law, under this section, or any provision in those regulations. So just to clarify why we would need the, those exemptions and what, maybe give some examples of cases where you would need to rely on those exemptions. Um, and a suggestion, I know it's clear, but to make it even more clear, 17.2, um, for the avoidance of doubt, embracery is not repealed. Um, my suggestion would have been to put the words, the offense of embracery, but you know, that's not too, too troubling um, a clause, Mr. Speaker. Um, the funding of part three litigation, funding agreements, again, I think provides transparency that is needed in the industry, in the legal profession. So I'm glad to see that that is actually coming forward now in this bill. And I did have another question on, on the determination of disputes under this agreement, uh, section nine, 3C, where it says, a person who is or claims to be entitled to be paid for the fees or disbursements in respect of which the contingency fee agreement is made. I'm just, my question is whether or not that would apply to creditors or is it it's just within the scope of the, the, the particular matter that would be before the courts? Or could that be applied to creditors generally? Speaker, those were the only sections that I, um, I had questions on or any 
sort of concerned, but again, I am wholeheartedly supporting this, this bill, and I look forward to its passage. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Call on the Honorable Attorney General to wind up. Um, Mr. Speaker, thank you. So if I might deal with it. If I might just briefly touch on the 19 2D, the exemptions. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the, the mischief there, if I might call it that, is because of the pu public policy implications involved in, in this kind of arrangements. What that is aimed at is to give the cabinet the flexibility, if you will, of either sort of delineating um, certain persons, classes of persons, or proceedings that should not be covered by the um, contingency or con conditional fee agreement, depending on, on the circumstances. So it's really sort of a, a providing some kind of a latitude, Mr. Speaker. Something might, it might happen that at some stage along the way, either the court or somebody brings something to the attention of the government to say, as a matter of public policy, I think either these classes of case are, should or should not be included. Um, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition spoke about what I mentioned about traffic matters, quasi-criminal, which I mentioned as traffic matters, whether at some stage along the way the cabinet takes the view that on reflection, um, things have evolved, and I now think that these quasi-criminal matters should be included in the, in the policy dealing with um, contingency fees or conditional fees arrangement and so. So that, that's, that's really the, the mystery behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of the, the, the various fees, as the, um, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition was trying to seek clarification on, Mr. Speaker, success fee is, 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 is defined in the, in the law. Success fee means any fee under contingency fee agreement which is higher than the normal fees of an attorney at law, but does not include a percentage of the amount of the value of the property recovered in an action or proceedings. So just, just to clarify there, you have the fee, which is the attorney's um, charge out fees. But that fee does not include the payout from the proceeds, if I, I keep using insurance pol um, policy. That fee would not include a sum from the amount recovered by the, by the victim of the traffic accident. So if the insurance company pays a million dollars, that is the value or the proceeds from the claim itself. That's not the fee. That's a different thing. And usually the attorney wouldn't get any of that. What the attorney would get is his charge out fees, which is money that he spent um, having conduct of the case, disbursements, reasonable expenses, plus his prof what we call his professional fees, which would be like his $900 an hour and so. So, so there's normal fees. Then on top of that, he would have what is called a kind of an uplift on that. So, <laughs> that's another way to describe it. What? Okay. 
No. Um, well, yes and no, but I said yes and no, Mr. Speaker, because the, the whole purpose here is that when he is doing this case, he will not know whether he's going to be successful or not. And if he is unsuccessful, all his efforts are unrewarded. He will never be able to get any fees. Won't be able to recover anything. Not a dime. So it is a risk that is taken. And the reason why that uplift is there is to compensate him for that risk that, that he took. Huh? Uplift yeah? is defined as over and above his yeah. normal fee. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> Sorry? Well, no, because, because again, I told you it has to be approved by the court. And so, and once the agreement is signed, then that's it. And if it is going to be revisited, it cannot be revisited with the, with the approval of the court. And that's why, so the client in fairness knows what he or she is entering into before the case starts. And so, and it, and it works both ways. If at the end of the day, it turned out that somehow the agreement was unfair, lopsided, and the client should have recovered or should have retained more. The court can reopen the agreement and says, listen, you need to be able to pay back this amount to the client. That's all it. Are you kidding? They would probably have, a, have an idea. And so. Yeah, there's, a, <laughs> there's a practice direction, for example, which says so the lawyers, some lawyers' fees. So more than 15 years, up to 300, or 300, 300 UCI, or $365 US. Between 10 and 15 years, 275 or US 335 and so on, and, you know, depending on years of call. But you also have other fees, which we call refresher fees. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's the nature of the business. That's the nature of the business. So if, if you come and, and you retain a lawyer, if he has to be calling you every second, he needs money to buy um, paper or to mail out something, it doesn't work that way. So you basically initially put in funds so that you have some money to to do this um, things like those. If you need to send something by FedEx, he doesn't have to be calling you to come in to give him fifty. Yeah, right. And so, so and all of that. But there's a normal fee that our lawyers would charge, which is a reasonable which is a reasonable fee depending on the the complexity of the case, the length of it. Amount of hours put in and all of that, so it is it is written down somewhere. It's not um. They do, yeah. So they have to the balance. Yeah. So it's a professional thing. Thank you. Um, it's not all that bad, though, because what the lawyer is doing is really putting you in funds in circumstances where you may not have recovered anything at all, because you would not have been able to access justice uh, because of the prohibit because of the prohibitive cost. Of and they will not be able to take more, as I said, because. In addition to what is going to be in this law, the Grand Court will be issuing rules. The Grand Court Rules Committee will be issuing rules that will help to guide the process as to entitlements and so on. So I think, that, Mr. Leader, they are, I'm confident that there will be enough 
safeguards to ensure fairness in the circumstances. Yes, um, the point about the legal association, point taken. Um, so we will address that to, I think, what has happened. Um, the other association sort of came on the scene late. So when all of these, some of these papers were going out and the consultations being done, we only had one at a time. So it will now, instead of prescribing one uh, association, it will probably just say, Association representing lawyers. Yeah, so I think so. Alpha was one with one So, Point taken. Yeah. So it will it, it will be open to yes. if you if later down the road you have three more associations yes. then they are all included you as part of the process. Right. Yeah. Honourable so, members, so point taken. both sides, can this stuff be discussed in committee rather than across the yeah. the aisle? Mr. Speaker, sorry about that. My apologies, but um, I think we we're there now. And so, thank you very much. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, it only falls for me to thank honorable members for their contribution to the bill. Um, and to also... Th yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I suppose we'll have to give that some more thoughts because the... the the whole idea here, as you, as I articulated earlier, was to ensure that whatever proceeds flows, a uh, flow, flow, rather proceeds flow from this, this process uh, where a child is involved, then of course paramount importance and consideration is that the child benefits from this in a, in a maximum way. Um, there are clearly going to be some matrimonial matters where no child or no children are involved where a contingency agreement would be appropriate. But I, I mean, I can't stand here and think of all the possible scenarios where that will be. And hence again, as I said, the, the benefit of that omnibus clause at the back there, which allows the cabinet to add to or remove cases that they think might benefit from this contingency arrangement. So, so Mr. Speaker, I thank honorable members for the debate and support of the bill. And I just want to also thank the Law Reform Directorate and the Law Reform Commissioners, Mr. Speaker, over the years and, and current ones for the hard work and their clearly detailed consideration of all these issues. And so I commend the bill to honorable members again. Um, I certainly will ask the Law Reform Commission to look at the two first issues raised by the honorable leader of the opposition about whether there can be carve outs for these instances. Question is, that a bill shortly entitled the Private Funding of Legal Services Bill 2020 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The Private Funding of Legal Services Bill 2020 has been given a second reading. Registered. Land Amendment Bill 2020. Mr. Speaker. The Honorable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Minister um, for Lands is absent today on constituency business in Cayman Brack. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I would like to move the relevant standing order. I'm not 
sure what the, which one it is, to allow the agenda to be, to the, or the paper to be um, reconfigured so that those two bills which she has carriage of, the Registered Land Amendment Bill 2020 and the Prescription Amendment Bill 2020, to put them at the bottom of the list and hopefully by then I shall have some indication as to whether she wishes to proceed with them at this meeting or whether they should be withdrawn. So that's, Quest sorry. Question is, that. honorable members, that items two and three on second reading be shifted to the bottom of the order paper on second readings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, the ayes have it. Those items two and three under second readings will go down on the bottom of that aspect of our agenda. Virtual Asset Service Providers, Amendment Bill 2020. Honorable Minister of Financial Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of a bill entitled, or shortly entitled, the Virtual Asset Service Providers Amendment Bill 2020. The bill has been duly moved. Is the Honorable Minister speaking there at all? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to present the bill on behalf of the government. It is a bill that seeks to amend the Virtual Asset Service Provider Law 2020 in order to give Cabinet the power to make regulations to provide for a transitional period to be applied to the coming into operation of any provision of the Virtual Asset Service Providers Law 2020. Mr. Speaker, the amendment bill also makes necessary changes to the Virtual Asset Service Providers Law, which serve to ensure a definition aligns with the Financial Action Task Force Global Standards and to revise certain provisions to clarify and facilitate a gradual phase commencement of the law. Mr. Speaker, the Virtual Asset Service Providers Law was passed at the Legislative Assembly or by the Legislative Assembly on May 25th, 2020 as part of the regulatory framework for the Virtual Assets Services in the jurisdiction. This framework was drafted in order to implement the global standards pertaining to the supervision and regulation of virtual asset service providers and services, which were adopted in June 2019 by the Financial Action Task Force and to implement a regime that would protect the user and clients of virtual asset services. Mr. Speaker, since the passing of this framework, I am pleased to report that the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force has acknowledged the legislation and the steps Cayman has taken towards the implementation of the revised FATF standards for virtual asset services. It was uh, important to commence the framework in 2020 in order to meet the commitments made to the CFATF and to ensure that the jurisdiction was in a position to report uh, the, on these positive developments at the 2020 CFATF plenary. Mr. Speaker, this information collected will also help prepare the jurisdiction for the FATF's next 12-month review of the virtual asset service providers. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry for Financial Services and Home Affairs therefore consulted with the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority in order to develop a strategy regarding the commencement of the framework and necessary regulations to enact the law. During these consultations, the authority acknowledged that very specific technology and highly specialized expertise is necessary for the effective supervision of virtual asset service providers and that new industry guidance would need to be developed. Additionally, it was noted that a progressive approach to the commencement of the law would also help market participants by granting them more time to adapt to the requirements of the framework. The Ministry therefore adopted a phased approach to the commencement of the framework and 
with an initial focus on AML CFT supervision. Mr. Speaker, the minister, the ministry therefore proposed, as I said, this phrased commencement uh, uh, to cabinet in late October, and the necessary legislation was published in the Gazette on October 29th, 2020. The commencement of the framework will take place in two distinct phases. The first phase began on October 31st, 2020, and commenced provisions of the legislation which pertain to the anti-money laundering and countering of financing of terrorism supervision only, and creates a registration and notification requirement for VASPs at this time. The second phase is expected to begin in June 2021, and will commence the framework's elements which focus on consumer protection, including the licensing requirement for virtual asset custodians and virtual asset trading platform operators. Mr. Speaker, certain changes are required to be made to the Virtual Asset Service Providers Law or Act 2020 now in order to facilitate this phased commencement, foremost of which is the addition of a transitional provision to the Act. A transitional provision will allow persons conducting for virtual asset services the additional time to comply with the requirements without incurring a penalty as provisions of the framework are gradually commenced. The Ministry is therefore presenting this bill to this Honourable House in order to give Cabinet the power to make regulations to provide for such savings, transitional and consequential provisions to have effect in connection with the coming into the operation of any provision of the law. Mr. Speaker, another change to the Virtual Asset Service Providers Law, which is included in this bill, pertains to the term obliged entity. This term defines foreign persons or entities engaged in virtual asset services as one who are registered or licensed in another non-high-risk jurisdiction. It was noted during the CFATF review, Mr. Speaker, of the legislation that the, that the term did not include foreign financial institutions. So, Mr. Speaker, this definition is therefore being revised to include these foreign entities in the, expressly in the definition in order to comply with the recommendations made as a result of the review of the legislation when it was presented to the CFATF. This change will ensure that information regarding the person sending a virtual asset transfer is sent to appropriate foreign entities when necessary and as directed by the anti-money laundering regulations and in accordance with global standards. Mr. Speaker, another change included in the bill states that virtual, uh, relates to virtual asset issuances. There have been uh, a number of such issuances taking place from within the Cayman Islands, and an important part of the virtual asset regulatory framework is to ensure that these issuances are supervised for AML and CFT purposes. Mr. Speaker, as currently drafted, Section 7 of the Virtual Asset Service Providers Law could be misinterpreted such that virtual asset insurers are only required to seek approval from the authority for an issuance only for a certain type of virtual asset issuance. Therefore, the proposed change clarifies that all issuances taking place from within the Cayman Islands are required to seek approval prior to issuing virtual assets to the public, as was intended by the law. Mr. Speaker, this regime helps protect the reputation of the Cayman Islands by ensuring that only legitimate issuances are taking place from within our shores, and also helps to protect any participants in these issuances by providing essential oversight of these activities. Mr. Speaker, the amendment bill amends Section 9 to allow for VASPs engaging in securities investment business to also be registered under the securities investment business law and directs an existing licensee engaging in virtual asset services to comply with the requirements of the VASP law as directed by the Monetary Authority. Mr. Speaker, the amendment bill which is presented to this Honourable Parliament today 
make certain small changes which will facilitate the coming into force and the proper implementation of the virtual asset regulatory framework. The commencement of the framework is crucial for the continued progress to be made in compliance with emerging global standards and will enable the Cayman Islands government to collect and analyze valuable information on the type and nature of, vir of virtual asset services and activities that are taking place in the jurisdiction, which in turn will allow us to ensure that these activities are taking place in a manner which is conducive to the well-being of its users and the financial services industry in this jurisdiction. Mr. Speaker, the bill is arranged into six clauses. Clause one of the bill provides for a short title and commencement of the legislation. Clause two amends section two of the principal law to amend the definition of the term obliged entity to include an obligated entity, a financial institution that provides a virtual asset service that is licensed or registered and is supervised for virtual asset services by a government regulatory body in another non-high risk jurisdiction. Clause three amends section seven of the principal law to clarify the requirements for a registered person in relation to the issuance of virtual assets. Clause four amends section nine of the principal law to include the requirement for a virtual asset service provider to be registered under the Securities Investment Business Law 2020 revision in order to engage in securities investment business. Clause five amends section 15 of the law to require an existing licensee to comply with any relevant provisions of the law as the authority may require. And Clause 6 amends Section 39 of the Principal Law to give the Cabinet the power to make regulations to provide for savings, transitional and consequential provisions. Mr. Speaker, this concludes my presentation of the proposed bill and I therefore commend the bill to this Honourable House for its second reading. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? The Honorable the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, just to say that I rise to lend my voice in support of the bill uh, being proposed by the Honorable Minister. Um, and to observe, Mr. Speaker, you, you would have heard me uh, mentioned a number of occasions that this is an evolving issue as it relates to FATF standards. Mr. Speaker, when the Cayman Islands was first evaluated, um, when we had our first mutual, our fourth round mutual evaluation, virtual asset was not one of the standards under the FATF um, framework. After we were evaluated, Mr. Speaker, our reports prepared and everything was done and we were under discussion with the FATF and the CFATF and EU and others. The FATF subsequently came up with a requirement for virtual assets to be regulated. It was done post mutual evaluation of the Cayman Islands. And not only was it done, Mr. Speaker, it, it was then imposed upon us as a requirement something to address. And so when we spoke about the rules changing in midstream, that is probably one of the one, one of the classic examples of the rules changing as we go along. So they came up with this requirement now that virtual assets, I think is recommendation 15, has to be, we have to show that we have a sufficient legislative Legislative, legislative and administrative framework in place to address virtual assets and to regulate virtual assets service providers, VASP, and so. And Mr. Speaker, I can tell you as I stand here, they are holding our feet to the fire. So that was what prompted the legislation which the government moved on very quickly, thanks to the Ministry of Financial Services, and all the other pieces, all the other framework supporting uh, uh, aspects being put in place to ensure that when we are reviewed against that particular recommendation as it relates to 
virtual assets and virtual asset service providers, we would have met the standard. We should or must be able to demonstrate that we have met the standard set by the FATF as it relates to virtual assets, Mr. Speaker. So that is one of those rules that were changed, Mr. Speaker, mystery, literal end of life. And of course, for whatever reasons, there are a number of literature around the place, publications that mention the amount of traffic that is passing through the Cayman Islands as it relates to virtual assets. And so we are uh, understandably in the crosshairs, if you will, of the rest of the world and certainly the standard setters as it relates to this particular product. So Mr. Speaker, the legislation is timely, the amendments are understandable, and this is all in a bid, Mr. Speaker, to meet the ever-evolving standards by the FATF, Mr. Speaker. So I also commend the bill to honorable members. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? I'll call now on the Honorable Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to thank the Honorable Attorney General for his elucidation of the, of the history of the original legislation and as he underscored the fact that as we move to meet the global standards as set, they continue to evolve um, during that process. So certainly the government is doing all that we can to try to ensure that we stay compliant with this ever-evolving global regulatory landscape. And I do thank the rest of the chamber for uh, its tacit support of this bill moving forward in this way. Question is that a bill shortly entitled the Virtual Asset Service Providers Amendment Bill 2020 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The Virtual Asset Service Providers Amendment Bill 2020 has been given a second reading. Companies Amendment Number 3, Bill 2020. The Honorable the Minister of Financial Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of a bill entitled The Company's Amendment Number 3, Bill 2020. The bill has been duly moved. Is the minister speaking there too? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I rise to present this bill on behalf of the government. It is a bill that seeks to amend the Company's Law 2020 revision to include the Customs and Border Control Service in the list of entities which may request information from the registrar to adjust re references to the list of equivalent jurisdictions published under the Anti-Money Laundering Regulations 2020 revision to repeal the sections of the law relating to bearer shares to require companies to maintain and file with the registrar information on the nature of its business and for incidental and connected purposes. Mr. Speaker, this amendment to the company's law 2020 revision is again responsive to the jurisdiction's assessment by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force that was published in March 2019. Accordingly, this bill makes an amendment to extend the obligation to file the nature of business activity to non-exempted companies uh, on an annual basis. Um, Mr. Speaker, this will demonstrate to the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force that the Cayman Islands is meeting Recommended Action 27, which uh, said that the Cayman Islands needs to implement these measures to allow for basic regulating powers on legal persons to be publicly available. Mr. Speaker, it should be noted that amendments to the law um, were made previously during the year in the May 2020 sitting to require all companies, that includes the resident and non-resident companies, to file their nature of business upon registration. Um, Mr. Speaker, exempted companies and limited liability companies were also required to submit the nature of business information annually with their annual returns. So, Mr. Speaker, at that time, the annual return obligation was uh, limited to the exempted companies and limited liability companies. 
but all companies, including the resident and non-resident companies, had the obligation from uh, earlier this year to file their nature of business upon registration of such companies. Mr. Speaker, this amendment bill extends the requirement to submit the nature of business annually to local companies, that being resident and non-resident companies as well. And once commenced, this introduces an obligation on the company to select a primary nature of business from what is a drop-down list, essentially. So, Mr. Speaker, um, with respect to the, the filing system, uh, the registrar attempts to make the process as user-friendly as possible by allowing for the selection of a, of a category as listed in the drop-down menu. It should also be noted, Mr. Speaker, that the, the bill, once it is passed um, into, into law as an act, uh, would require an order by Cabinet in order for the provisions of the bill to commence. And as such, when it comes to this particular provision, it is not anticipated that the uh, requirement would be com commenced upon Gazettal, um, given the timing of when the annual returns are due for January 2021. And so therefore, the, the legal obligation to file this on an annual basis will not apply to the annual returns due in January 2021. Um, however, local companies, that being resident and non-resident, still are able to file their nature of business voluntarily, as some have been doing um, up until this point, uh, until, of course, it is then going to be legally required for their annual returns due in the January 2022 cycle. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the bill removes the legislative penalty where there is default with the with complying with a request for information from the competent authority. This breach is now captured by the beneficial ownership administrative fines regime, and this amendment is in line with advice received from the Attorney General's chambers. This bill also clarifies the competent authorities with whom the registrar is ob obligated to provide and share information upon request within 48 hours. The manner in which such uh, or, or in which Section 26A2F of the company's law was drafted, Mr. Speaker, inadvertently excludes the Customs and Border Control Services from requesting information. Specifically, Mr. Speaker, the Customs and Border Control Service is now identified as one of the competent authorities, and the provisions clarify that information may be requested by a competent authority as defined under Section 21 of the Proceeds of Crime Law. 2020 revision. In addition, this bill makes amendments for changes deemed consequential to the changes made in the Proceeds of Crime Law and the Anti-Money Laundering Regulations. Since the equivalent jurisdictions list is no longer published in the Gazette by the Anti-Money Laundering Steering Group, references to the list have been replaced with text to align with the amendments that were made to the Proceeds of Crime Law and the Anti-Money Laundering Regulations. Mr. Speaker, for efficiency, rather than adjust the definition of custodian, which ref references the equivalent jurisdictions list and relates to bearer shares, this has been repealed as bearer shares are no longer applicable in the Cayman Islands. Finally, the bill also repeals and substitutes part 15, custody, etc., of bearer shares with the proposed section 229 as bearer shares, again, as I indicated, are no longer applicable in the Cayman Islands. Mr. Speaker, the bill is arranged in several clauses. Clause one contains a short title of the legislation. Clause two repeals the definition of the word custodian as relates to part 15, which is being repealed and substituted under clause five. Clause three seeks to amend section 26A2 to include the list in the list of entities which may request information from the registrar, the Customs and Border Control Service established under Section 3 of the Customs and Border Control Law 2018. Clause 3 also seeks to amend Section 26A to repeal and substitute Paragraph F of Subsection 2 to clarify information may only be requested from the registrar by a competent authority as defined under Section 2.1 of the Proceeds of Crime Law. Clause 4, amend Section 41 to require a company which meets the criteria under Section 41.1 to 
to specify in the summary contained in the annual list prepared by the company information on the nature of the company's business. Clause 5 repeals, the, repeals and substitutes a proposed new Part 15 of the principal law, which contains proposed Section 229. The proposed Section 229 prohibits the issue of bearer shares by a company, provides for the prohibition on issuing bearer shares to apply to companies which have been struck off the company's register, prohibits the court from permitting a company which has been struck off from being reinstated with bearer shares in issue, and provides for bearer shares issued prior to the commencement of the amending law are contrary to subsection 1 to be void. And again, Mr. Speaker, these provisions relating to bearer shares are really just clean-up provisions because the issuance and the, the ability to operate with bearer shares have long been um, discontinued in the jurisdiction in a number of ways. Clause 6 amends 245.1 by deleting and substituting paragraph D, which provides for a legal entity regulated in a jurisdiction included in the jurisdictions that are designated as having measures for combating money laundering and the financing of terrorism, which are equivalent to that of the islands in accordance with Section 5.2 of the Proceeds of Crime Law 2020 revision to be exempted from the requirements under Part 17A of the law. Clause 6 also amends subsection 2 by replacing the reference to the lists published in the Gazette and referred to in Regulations 22D and 23.1 of the Anti-Money Laundering Regulations 2020 revision with a reference to the jurisdictions that are designated as having measures for combating money laundering and the financing of terrorism which are equivalent to that of the islands in accordance with Section 5.2 of the Proceeds of Crime Law 2020 revision. Again, Mr. Speaker, this is a provision that, uh, that basically provides a tick and tie um, tidying up exercise with the changes that were made to the Proceeds of Crime Law and the anti-money laundering regulations earlier in the year. Clause 7 amends Section 279A by repealing subsection 3. Mr. Speaker, this concludes my presentation of the proposed bill. There is a committee stage amendment that will be presented at that time. And in closing, I wish to thank my ministry staff, relevant members of the financial services industry, and the legislative drafting department for their efforts with respect to the design and preparation of this bill. I therefore commend the company's amendment number three bill 2020 to this honorable house for its second reading. The question is that a bill shortly entitled the Company's Amendment Number 3 Bill 2020 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The Company's Amendment Number 3 Bill 2020 has been given a second reading. I think you all lost your chance. Sounded like Mr. Shea had done that too. And then you all voted for it. <clears throat> Property miscellaneous provisions, Amendment Bill 2020. The Honorable the Minister of Financial Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the second reading of a bill entitled the Property Miscellaneous Provisions Amendment Bill 2020. The bill has been duly moved. Is the Minister speaking there at all? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I rise to present this bill on behalf of the government. It is a bill for the law to, uh, it is a bill to amend the property miscellaneous provisions law 2017 and to provide for the virtual witnessing and attestation of required signatures for the execution of a deed or instrument under seal and for incidental and connected purposes. Mr. Speaker, 
This amendment to the Property Miscellaneous Provisions Law of 2017 revision seeks to reduce the potential negative impact of the COVID-19 um, with regards to the conduct of certain types of financial services, business activities. Under the current law, Mr. Speaker, one of the requirements for a deed and instrument under seal to be validly executed is that the deed or instrument should be signed in the presence of a witness. The law does not define presence, Mr. Speaker, and it is therefore unclear if presence will include virtual presence. Mr. Speaker, this bill seeks to assist the financial services industry by providing that presence will include virtual presence for the purposes of witnessing deeds and instruments for a temporary period in anticipation of the lifting of the global COVID-19 restrictions in the near future. Mr. Speaker, the new subsection was inserted at section 8.4 that allows for the virtual witnessing of the execution of a deed or instrument under seal with certain requirements, which includes, amongst other things, that the witness can properly see the signing of the deed or instrument remotely, and that the person signing the deed or instrument identify himself or herself with a photo identification. In order to align the amendment to the Notary's Public Virtual Conduct Not Notarial Acts Regulations 2020, which are the temporary regulations that is also um, a part of the COVID-19 relief measures that was passed by the cabinet earlier this year. This new subsection will be a temporary amendment and will elapse by the 16th of April, 2022, or on such date as cabinet may decide. Mr. Speaker, the bill was developed in consultation with the ministry and the consultation with the financial services industry took place via the various industry associations in August. Input from all stakeholders was duly considered and where appropriate changes incorporated into the bill were made in, uh, um, in the bill as reflected before this house today. Mr. Speaker, the bill is arranged into two clauses. Clause one of the bill provides for the short title of the legislation Clause 2 amends Section 8 of the Principal Law by inserting proposed new subsection 4A. The proposed new subsection 4A provides for the period beginning of the date of commencement of this amending law and ending on the 16th of April 2022 or such other date that Cabinet may by order or may appoint by order a deed or instrument may be signed in the virtual presence of a witness. The proposed new subsection 4A further requires that where a deed or instrument is signed in the virtual presence of a witness, um, that witness must be able to view the remote signing of the deed or instrument contemporaneously with the individual signing the deed or instrument present, um, and that individual must have a valid photo identification um, indicating that it is the witness one and the same who is actually making the signature as the countersigning witness. Mr. Speaker, Clause 2 amends Section 8, 5, and 6 to include references to the proposed new subsection 4A. And Mr. Speaker, this concludes my presentation of the proposed bill. Uh, there is a minor committee stage amendment to, to be made to this bill and it will be presented at that time. Again, in closing, I wish to thank the ministry staff, relevant members of the financial services industry, and the legislative drafting department for their efforts with respect to the design and preparation of this bill. And I therefore commend the Properties Miscellaneous Provisions Amendment Bill 2020 to this Honorable House for its second reading. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Call on the mover for her right of reply. Thanks. Just to say, Mr. Speaker, I thank everyone in the chamber for their tacit support in this effort to ensure that the financial services industry can continue to vibrantly operate during these challenging times presented by COVID-19. Question is, that a bill shortly entitled the Property Miscellaneous Provisions Amendment Bill 2020 be 
be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The property miscellaneous provisions amendment bill 2020 has been given a second reading. Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill 2020. The Honorable the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the unfortunate absence of the Minister of Commerce, Planning and Infrastructure, I beg to move the second reading of a bill shortly entitled the Special Economic Zone Zones Amendment Bill 2020. The bill has been duly moved. Is the Honorable Premier speaking to the bill? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the fourth round of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force Mutual Evaluation Report describes a number of key findings in relation to the jurisdiction's anti-money laundering and countering financing of terrorism framework, known often as the AML-CFT framework, and provides recommended actions for the jurisdiction in order to ensure that the framework is enhanced. The following recommended action was identified in relation to the Special Economic Zone regime as it pertains to AML-CFT. That the Cayman Islands should update and further deepen the analysis on vulnerabilities and risks present in parts of the financial sector subject to limited or no supervision. For example, the commodities and derivatives part of the Special Economic Zone. Mr. Speaker, a risk assessment was undertaken in relation to the Special Economic Zone, and it found that the inherent risks of companies operating from the zone do not differ in any material way from the inherent risks of companies of the same type that operate outside the zone. All criminal, civil, and regulatory laws in the Cayman Islands, including the Proceeds of Crime Act and anti-money laundering regulations, apply equally to special economic zone companies and non-special economic zone companies. Moreover, the entities in the zone that conduct relevant financial business are subject to the same supervisory oversight as similar entities that operate out of the zone. One of the key findings from the analysis of the, of the Special Economic Zone included the need for more granular information on the activities being conducted by companies operating in the zone to determine whether they are carrying on relevant financial business or carrying on business in accordance with the Special Economic Zone order. It was also recommended that the process for the acceptance of companies into the zone could be enhanced and that companies should be required to notify the Special Economic Zone Authority of significant changes in their operations. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry has made the necessary amendments to the legislation relating to the findings of the Special Economic Zone Risk Assessment. This bill seeks to amend the Special Economic Zone's 2017 revision to provide for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist and proliferation financing requirements. The bill is arranged into 15 clauses. Clause 1 provides the short title of the legislation. Clause 2 amends Section 2 of the Principal Law to provide for new definitions in the legislation. <coughs> Clause 3 amends Section 3 of the Principal Law to make changes to the composition of the Special Economic Zone Authority. Clause 4 amends Section 5 of the Principal Law to require the authority to share or provide any information required for anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, 
or counter-proliferation financing purposes. Clause 5 rec amends Section 6 of the Principal Law to provide for the enhanced investigative powers of the authority, which include the examination of the annual returns and other documents of a special economic zone enterprise for the purpose of ensuring that the special economic zone enterprises comply with enterprise complies with its trade certificate and the law. The provision would also enable the authority to delegate to the Secretariat the authority's function of examining and processing applications with respect to the approval and refusal of applications for renewal. Clause 6 inserts in the principal law a new Section 6A of the principal law to provide for the additional powers of the authority to impose certain measures and conditions on a special economic zone enterprise upon the authority's findings that the special economic zone enterprise has, among other things, acted in a manner detrimental to the public interest or contravened its trade certificate, the law, or its regulations. Clause 7 repeals Section 11 of the Principal Law. Clause 8 amends Section 14 of the Principal Law to require that an applicant for a trade certificate as well as the controller, beneficial owner, director and senior officer of the applicant must be a fit and proper person. Clause 9 amends Section 16 of the Principal Law to require that the authority refuse the grant of a trade certificate where the grant of the application is not in the public interest, including where it presents a high level of reputational risk for the jurisdiction, or where the applicant is or has a controller, beneficial owner, director, senior officer, or shareholder that is not a fit and proper person. Clause 10 amends Section 18 of the Principal Law to clarify that subject to the exceptions specified in the law, a special economic zone enterprise must comply with all laws of the islands. Clause 11 amends Section 23 of the Principal Law to enable the authority to amend the trade certificate to change the name of an applicant, director, shareholder, or controller. Clause 12 inserts a new Section 24A in the Principal Law to require a special economic zone enterprise to notify the authority of any material change to its business activities, controllers, directors, or shareholders within 21 days of such change. Clause 13 amends Section 26 of the Principal Law to, pro to empower the authority to revoke or suspend a trade certificate issued to a special economic enterprise where the special economic zone enterprise fails to comply with the conditions of its trade certificate and certain prescribed requirements. Clause 14 inserts Section 29C in the Principal Law to require the Special Economic Zone Enterprise to file an annual return in the form and manner prescribed by regulations made by the Cabinet. Clause 15 amends Section 30 of the Principal Law to enable the Cabinet to make regulations to prescribe administrative fines and the forms and procedures for the payment of such fines to be imposed by the authority under the law. This, this provision also empowers Cabinet to make regulations to, pro to provide for the form of any return to be made under the legislation. Mr. Speaker, there have been a number of recommendations that have arisen as a result of the 21-day consultation period. These amendments will be addressed in the Committee on Bills as appropriate. And Mr. Speaker, this concludes my presentation of the proposed bill, and I commend the Special Economic Zone Amendment Bill 2020 to honorable members for safe passage. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? I'll call now on the mover of the bill to exercise his right. 
Mr. Speaker, I simply wish to thank all honorable members for their tacit support of this important bill. Question is that a bill shortly entitled the Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill 2020 be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill 2020 has been given a second reading. Health Care Decisions Amendment Bill 2020. Mr. Speaker. The Honorable the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I seek the indulgence of the House, I suppose, by way of motion, to have these bills switched around in the order paper so as to allow for me to take the Penal Code Amendment Bill first, and then that bill informs the Health Care Decision Bill. So, with the leave of the House. Honorable. Honorable Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the, yes, yeah, thanks. Beg to move a motion so that the Penal Code and the Health Care Decision Bill be rearranged so that the Penal Code Amendment Bill be taken first, as number eight, and thereafter the Health Care Division Bill be taken after. Question is that the Penal Code Amendment Number 2, Bill 2020, move up to Number 8, and Number 8 be moved to Number 9. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Honorable Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, with the leave, I beg to move the second reading of a bill entitled the Penal Code Amendment Number 2, Bill 2020, the long, the long title of which is which, which, which kind of <laughs> Penal Code Amendment Number Two, Bill Twenty Twenty. Honorable members, we have long passed our stage. I understand the clerk's desire to stick to the written word. Honorable Attorney General. My apologies to the clerk, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> My apologies to Madam Clerk. Sorry, so Mr. It's Speaker. It's the time of the year yeah, if I might to move start, fast. Yeah, so if I might start again. I beg, <laughs> I beg to move for the second reading of a bill entitled the Penal Code Amendment Number 2 Bill 2020, Mr. Speaker. The bill has been duly moved. Honorable Attorney General speaking. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Huh? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the long title of the bill I uh, have begged to move is the second reading of is a bill for a law to amend the Penal Code 2019 revision to decriminalize suicide and to introduce criminal liability for complicity in a person's suicide and for incidental and connected purposes. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, the purpose of this proposed legislation is to provide for the decriminalization of suicide and by extension, Mr. Speaker, attempted suicide. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in January of last year, I asked of the Law Reform Commission to review the penal laws dealing with suicide, and in particular, Mr. Speaker, to consider whether the offense of suicide should be decriminalized. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this referral came against the background of a submission that was made by made to the Commission by the Legal Committee of the Alex Pantan Foundation, 
proposing the decriminalization of suicide. The amendments before this House, uh, before this Parliament, are small, Mr. Speaker, but very significant. You see, Mr. Speaker, suicide is the act of intentionally taking one's own life. An attempted suicide is the non-fatal, self-inflicted, potentially injurious behavior with the intention of causing one's death. Mr. Speaker, among young people 15 to 29 years of age, research has shown that suicide is the second leading cause of death globally. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, a recent National Survey of Children and Youth at several Cayman Islands public and private schools, including Mr. Speaker, students at the university level, which was undertaken by the National Drug Council in collaboration with the Alex Panton Foundation, produced statistics, Mr. Speaker, which shows that the rate of suicidal thoughts and attempts at continuously rise are, sorry, are continuously rising in the Cayman Islands. I say that again, sir, that the rates of suicidal thoughts and attempts are continuously rising in Cayman Islands, particularly, Mr. Speaker, amongst our children and young people. Mr. Speaker, indeed, one in three children surveyed reported suicidal ideas and 13% reported having attempted suicide. What is equally troubling, sir, is the fact that the survey shows that only 5% of these persons are seeking any treatment by way of help. So, Mr. Speaker, the key risk factors for suicide are found to be mental disorders such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, personality disorders, depression as a result of stressful life events, and Mr. Speaker, no surprise, bullying. Mr. Speaker, in regards to the latter, I take the opportunity to point out that the Law Reform Commission has submitted to me its final report dealing with bullying in schools. The report, Mr. Speaker, recognizes the link between bullying and suicide and the recommendations of the Commission seek to put forward legislative measures that would address bullying in schools. And so, Mr. Speaker, at the appropriate time, the report will be considered by the Cabinet. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I know that members of Parliament and indeed the public may find it incomprehensible to think that a person who commits suicide is liable to criminal sanctions and thereafter punishment, notwithstanding the fact that the person is dead. So, Mr. Speaker, some might call it an absurdity. But, Mr. Speaker, this is the position under the common law. It is considered a felony committed on oneself, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, what usually happens, sorry, Mr. Speaker, yeah, in early, in early English common law, as I said, it is described as fellow desa, which is a felony committed against oneself. And a person found guilty of suicide, even though the person is dead, was subject to various punishments, if I might put it that way, Mr. Speaker, um, including the forfeiture of property to the Crown, and of course being given a profane funeral, Mr. Speaker, one that is less than dignified. And Mr. Speaker, what would also happen is that the person's family would have scorns pour upon them and so on. So, and of course, the body would be desecrated. That was to show the disgust of someone having committed suicide. So they were treated to a less than irreverent 
I will give an irreverent funeral, sorry, a burial. Um, Mr. Speaker, the common law offense of suicide was saved in Cayman Islands legislation by Section 40 of the Interpretation Act, and there are no provisions repealing the offense of the Cayman Islands, whether by way of order in council or through any other legislation. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, Section 2A of the Penal Code provides that, and I quote, nothing in this law shall affect the liability, trial, or punishment of a person for an offense against the common law or any other law in force in Ireland. Again, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that the common law offense of suicide was abolished in England and Wales almost 60 years ago, no such abolition took place in the Cayman Islands. <clears throat> So, Speaker, in addition to that, attempted suicide is also an offence by virtue of Section 3181 of the Penal Code, which provides that when a person intending to commit an offence begins to put his intention into execution by means adopted to its fulfilment and manifests his intention by some overt act, but does not fulfil his intention to such an extent as to commit the offence, he is deemed to attempt to commit the offence. Mr. Speaker, although there are no examples of cases of prosecutions for suicide or attempted suicide in the Cayman Islands, historically in England and Wales, Mr. Speaker, prosecutions against persons who attempted suicide and survived were discharged, but there are some that were fined, Mr. Speaker, sent to prison for a sentence of up to six months. Mr. Speaker, the Cayman Islands are among the minority of countries, mainly from the African and Asian regions that still criminalize suicide or attempted suicide. Those countries with laws stipulating punishment for suicide do not actually prosecute people, Mr. Speaker. Um, they don't usually prosecute them for attempt, anyhow. Still on the books. <coughs> So, Mr. Speaker, what we're attempting to do here is in line with and supports the view that suicide should be decriminalized for the reasons, Mr. Speaker, that treatment rather than prosecution is the appropriate and recommended response for a person struggling with a mental health crisis. In other words, Mr. Speaker, it is, a, it is more of a mental health issue, not a crime. Mr. Speaker, it is on this premise that the Law Reform Commission carried out the comprehensive research and examination of the common law, the provisions in the penal code and interpretation law that save suicide as a criminal offense and make attempted suicide and assisted suicide criminal offenses. Mr. Speaker, the research findings of the commission informed the formulation of a discussion paper entitled, and I quote, the decriminalization of suicide and papers dated the 12th of August 2019, which sets out the Commission's initial recommendations regarding the decriminalization of suicide and related matters, Mr. Speaker. In the discussion paper, sir, the Commission considered the approach taken by the United Kingdom, the approach taken by Canada, the approach taken by India, among other countries in decriminalizing suicide. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with the reform process, the discussion paper was made available for public consultation and comments were received from several stakeholders, including the Alex Pandan, Alex Pandan Foundation, the Mental Health Commission, the Cayman Ministers Association, the Cayman Islands Legal Practitioners Association, among others. Mr. So Speaker, at the end of the consultation process, the Law Reform Commission submitted its final report on the decriminalization of suicide and a supporting Penal Code Amendment No. 2 Bill 2020, as well as the Health Care Decision Amendment Bill 2020, Mr. Speaker. So Speaker, the final recommendations of the Commission supported the view, as I said, that suicide should no longer be a crime in the Cayman Islands, but rather medical treatment should be the remedy and accordingly 
an amendment to the penal code to decriminalize suicide is the appropriate response to persons who are so distressed, Mr. Speaker, that they attempt to take their own lives. <clears throat> it's a medical problem, Mr. Speaker, not a legal one. Mr. Speaker, the bill is also informed by a second bill which is on the other paper, Mr. Speaker, the Health Care Directions, sorry, the Health Care Decisions Amendment Bill 2020, um, which is a companion measure to this Penal Code Amendment Bill, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I will speak to that after the presentation on this bill. But, Mr. Speaker, just to point out that this bill in Clause 2 <clears throat> inserts in the Penal Code 2019 revision a new Section 186A to provide for the abrogation of the rule of law, which makes it a crime for a person to commit suicide. In other words, Mr. Speaker, this amendment seeks to decriminalize the common law offense of suicide. The amendment, Mr. Speaker, would bring the law of the Cayman Islands in line with that of most countries, including the United Kingdom and Canada. Mr. Speaker, clause two of the bill deals with assisting in someone's suicide. <clears throat> and Mr. Speaker, assisted suicide is suicides undertaken with the aid or the encouragement of another person. In most countries, sir, assisted suicide is a crime with an exception in some cases for physician assisted suicide under limited and strict conditions. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, our Health Care Decision Act contains provision which, dealt, which deal with the circumstances under which assisted suicide may be permissible. Mr. Speaker, Section 18 of the Penal Code 2019 Revision makes it an offense to aid or abet, counsel or procure the commission of an offense and as such captures the offense of assisted suicide, which is aiding, abetting or counseling or procuring a person to commit suicide, as long as the suicide remains a criminal offense. But Mr. Speaker, if the common law offense of suicide is removed as is proposed by this bill, Assisted suicide under Section 18 of the Penal Code would also fall away unless express provision is made in the Penal Code to retain, to retain it and decriminalize it. So it would be an offence, Mr. Speaker, to encourage or assist the suicide or attempt the suicide of another person. Mr. Speaker, what Clause 2 seeks to do is to give effect to this retention by inserting into the Penal Code a new Section 186B which will provide for criminal liability for complicity in another person's suicide, Mr. Speaker. So we expressly retain the provision to say that if you assist, encourage, or procure another person committing suicide, then you would be liable in law under the Penal Code. Mr. Speaker, under the proposed new Section 186B, a person who does an act capable of encouraging or assisting the suicide of, or attempted suicide of another person, and it is proven that the act was intended to encourage or assist suicide or an attempted at suicide, commits an offense and is liable on conviction to imprisonment for a term of 14 years. So Speaker, it is important to know that a person may commit the offense whether or not a suicide or an attempted suicide occurs. Mr. Speaker, the new Section 186B also provides that if on the trial of an, in, an indictment sorry, for murder or manslaughter, it is proved that the accused person committed suicide and the accused who is being tried committed an offense under that section in relation to that suicide, then the accused <coughs> person may nevertheless be convicted of the offense. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, under the proposed section, of course, it will require, it will require sorry, the consent of the Director of Public Prosecutions 
to institute proceedings. Mr. Speaker, the government is of the firm view that the issue of suicide and treatment for suicide is a public health concern that needs to be managed in a sensitive and not a punitive way. Accordingly, Mr. Speaker and members of Parliament, I now seek the approval of this House in the passing of the Penal Code Amendment No. 2 Bill 2020 as it relates, Mr. Speaker, to the decriminalization of suicide. Thank you. Honorable Premier, can you do the suspension? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the suspension of Standing Order 10-2 in order that the business of the House may continue beyond the hour of interruption. Question is, that Standing Orders 10-2 be suspended in order for the business of this Honorable House to continue after 4.30 p.m. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The House continues its business. The question is that the bill entitled Penal Code Amendment Number 2 Bill 2020 be given a second reading. All those in favor... Yes. I, I really thought that the member from Northside was going, but you want to speak. Does any other member wish to speak, the member from Northside? I'm, I must say I'm paying attention to see whether members are willing to yeah. speak or not. As you can see, I'm not giving a long time for that to happen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's reasonable. Yes. I, I just have a, a, a couple of questions for the AG. Um, Will assistant suicide, as defined here, include family members advocating in the case of brain death of another member and whether doctor, because the next bill that we're going to do makes euthanasia a crime, even treating somebody in a coma. I just want to make sure that if, if, they, and if a doctor advises the family that this person is the likelihood of the person surviving and that it's best to terminate the life support. I just want to make sure that that is not covered in this as assisted suicide under up these various definitions here and whether we need to make an exemption for medical decisions which are allowed by next of kin and I think we also passed legislation last year about living wills where people can, can, can decide they don't want to be resuscitated and if the family insists that that living will is respected by the physicians and does not allow resuscitation whether there's any possibility of any of them being caught up under this assisted suicide definition. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? I'll call now on the Atton Honorable Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, in response to the Honorable Member, my understanding of the law is that if the person, first of all, makes what is called a healthcare decision at some stage, which is do not resuscitate, and get to that stage where it becomes incapacitated, brain dead, and all of that, then under the healthcare decision law, um, along with the, after discussion with the medical practitioner, that will, will be, has to be respected, and so. Um, in instances where the person does not have that kind of healthcare decision, but if the person becomes comatose and there's brain dead and there's no um, possibility of the person recovering and the healthcare practitioner makes that sort of uh, assessment and advise the, uh, or seek the, the sort of um, 
consent of the family, then as long as that it is done in that way, it is still permissible because it is a healthcare decision that is taken in those circumstances. So, but Mr. Speaker, the honorable member also mentioned that the healthcare bill is going to decriminalize, sorry, it's going to criminalize euthanasia and unassisted suicide. I think what we're trying to do in that bill, when I, when I get there, is really to define those terms, really. But they already appear in the healthcare decision law. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honorable members and others for their support of the Penal Code Amendment Number 2 Bill. Question is that the bill shortly entitled Penal Code Amendment Number 2 Bill 2020 be given a second reading. All those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The Penal Code Amendment Number 2 Bill 2020 has been given a second reading. Healthcare Decisions Amendment Bill 2020. The Honorable the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the second reading of the Healthcare Decision Amendment Bill 2020. The bill is duly moved, Honorable Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the long title of this bill is a bill for a law to amend the Healthcare Decision Law 2019 to define assisted suicide and euthanasia in light of amendments made to the penal or proposed amendments to the penal code 2019 revision to decriminalize suicide and for incidental and connected purposes. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of the legislation, as I said, is to define these two terms, assisted suicide and euthanasia as appear in the, already appear in the Healthcare Decision Act of 2019. You will recall, Mr. Speaker, that during my presentation on the Penal Code Amendment Bill 2020, I referred to the Healthcare Decision Amendment Bill, which is the companion measure to, to support the recommendations contained in the final report of the Law Reform Commission in its um, recommendation to deal with this common law offense of suicide. But Mr. Speaker, the Healthcare Decision Law 2019 expressly provides that the law does not authorize assisted suicide and euthanasia. The language in that law section forces this law shall not authorize euthanasia or assisted suicide. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, in light of the recommendations to amend the penal code to decriminalize suicide and to retain the offense of assisted suicide, it is proposed to make this consequential amendments to the Healthcare Decision Law 2019 in order to provide certainty and clarity, Mr. Speaker, as to when an act of assisted suicide and euthanasia will fall within the scope of the Penal Code. <coughs> Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Clause 1 provides for the short title and the commencement of the legislation. Mr. Speaker, Clause 2 amends Section 2 of the Healthcare Decision Law to insert definitions of the terms assisted suicide and euthanasia. Mr. Speaker, the term assisted suicide is defined to mean suicide undertaken by a person 
with the encouragement or assistance of another person. Whereas, Mr. Speaker, the term euthanasia is defined to mean the painless killing by a registered practitioner of a person suffering from an incurable and painful disease or a person in a coma. Mr. Speaker, with these small amendments to the Health Care Decision Act, along with the amendments to the Penal Code, the government believes that it would have adequate legislative measure in place to appropriately respond to any issue which relates to suicide, attempted suicide, assisted suicide, and encouraging suicide. And so, Mr. Speaker, I commend the bill to honorable members of this House. Does any, uh, does any other member wish to speak? The member for Northside. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to ask the AG if um, he doesn't want to look at the definition of euthanasia and delete or a person in a coma. Because I think it's fairly obvious if, if, the, if, it, if a registered practitioner is killing somebody who is suffering from an incurable and painful disease. But I think it becomes a little more dicey when you're talking about including persons who are in a coma. Talk because again, I think the law we require the law provides that the next of kin can make a decision I mean, to pull the plug out of the water. I believe in this situ this wider definition of euthanasia, it may prohibit the termination of life of somebody who is in a coma, even though they're only being maintained by machines. And if the family advocates for that to be done, they might be caught under assistance suicide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? I'll call now on the Attorney General to wind up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank to the Honorable Member from Northside for his observations. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I I understand where his head is at on this, um, and I'm hoping to give it further thoughts before we get to committee. And, uh, yeah. but thanks, Mr. Speaker, for the support and the bill otherwise. Thank you. Question is, that the bill shortly entitled the Health Care Decisions Amendment Bill 2020 Be given a second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The Health Care Decisions Amendment Bill 2020 has been given a second reading. The House Registered Land Amendment Bill 2020. Honorable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 27, I beg leave of this Honorable House to withdraw the bill shortly entitled the Registered Land Amendment Bill 2020. Question is that the Registered Land Law Amendment Bill 2020 be withdrawn on the Standing Order 27. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The Registered Land Law Amendment Bill 2020 has been withdrawn. Prescription Amendment Bill 2020. The Honorable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 27, I beg leave of this Honorable House to withdraw the bill shortly entitled the Prescription Amendment Bill 2020.
Question is that the prescription amendment bill 2020 be withdrawn under standing order 27. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against? No. The ayes have it. Prescription amendment bill 2020 has been withdrawn. Honorable Premier. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sorry. I live in too many places. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to the relevant standing order, I move that the order paper be rearranged in the section entitled Committee on Bills so that the Legal Services Bill 2020 be put at the bottom of the order of bills to be considered by the committee. Wait, sorry, which ones? Which bills? Sorry. The Legal Services Bill 2020 be put at the bottom of the order of bills to be considered by the committee. The question is that our order paper be rearranged so that the legal services bill be put back at the bottom of the order paper dealing with committee on bills. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, that is how it, the bill will be dealt with at the end of the committee on bills. The House will now move to committee stage. Please be seated. The House is now in committee. As per usual, we will authorize the Attorney General to correct minor errors and such in these bills. Private funding of legal services bill 2020 
short title, clause one, short title and commencement. Question is that clause one do not stand part of the bill. All in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Clause one stands part of the bill. Clause two, interpretation. I think the AG has an amendment there. Mr. Speaker, I do. Um, I beg to move that the bill be amended in. Clause two by deleting the definition of the words legal association. With. The amendment has been moved. Uh, you for the explaining on it, uh. Uh, Mr. Speaker. There is a consequential amendment to clause nineteen where the matter is dealt with. There. And so. Does anybody else wish to speak? If not, I'll move that the clause is amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. The ayes, those against, the ayes have it. Clause three, contingency fee agreements. Clause four, conditions applicable to con contingency fee agreements. Clause five, form and content of contingency fee agreements. Clause six, agreement not to affect costs as between party and party. Clause seven, claims for additional remuneration excluded. Clause eight, agreements receiving, sorry, agreements relieving attorney at law from liability for negligence void. Clause nine, determination of disputes under the agreement. Clause 10, enforcement of, agree of agreement. Clause 11, reopening of agreement. Clause 12, agreements made by client in fiduciary capacity. Clause 13, client paying without approval to be liable to estate. Clause 14, purchase of interest prohibited. Clause 15, bills under agreement not liable to taxation. Clause 16, litigation funding agreements. Clause 17, repeal of maintenance and cha Champ chopperty. Clause 18, civil rights in respect of maintenance and chopperty. Question is that clauses 3, 2, 18 do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clauses 3 through to 18 stands part of the bill. Clause 19, regulations. Honorable. Thank you, Mr. Attorney Mr. General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I beg to move, uh, pursue understanding order 52.1, that clause 19 of the bill be amended in clause 19.1 by deleting the words legal association, in inverted commas, and substituting the words comma, in um, quote, any local professional associations representing attorneys at law in the islands. The amendment has been duly moved. Is the AG speaking? 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, Hold that on. again is in keeping with the observations made during the debate that we there are now more than one association representing legal practitioners. And so just to make it abundantly clear that all part all stakeholders will be included in this definition. Question is, Mr. The, Mr. The, the clause has been moved, the member for Northside. Yeah. The amendment has been moved. And, and as a consequence of that, you're going to amend clause two to delete definition of legal, legal association? Oh, sorry, sorry. My you were out of the room. The question is that clause 19 be amended. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Question is that clause that the bill now be sorry. Sorry, the clause nineteen as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favor please say aye. All those in favor please say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause nineteen as amended stands part of the bill. A bill for a law to provide for the regulation of private funding of legal services and for incidental and connected purposes. Question is that the title to stand part of the bill, all those in favor, please say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The bill stands part of the, the title stands part of the bill. Virtual asset. Service Providers Amendment Bill 2020. Clause, Clause 1, short titling commencement. Clause 2, Amendment of Section 2 of the Virtual Asset Service Provi Providers Law 2020, Interpretation. Clause 3, Amendment of Section 7, Registered Persons, Virtual Asset Issuance. Clause 4, Amendment of Section 9, General Requirements for Virtual Asset Service Providers. Clause 5, Amendment of Section 15, Notice by Existing Licensee. Clause 6, Amendment of Section 39, Regulations. Question is that clauses 1 through to 6, do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clauses one through to six stands part of the bill. A bill for a law to amend the virtual asset service providers law 2020 to provide for saving and transitional matters and for incidental and connected purposes. Question is that the title of the bill do stand, the title do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The title is now part of the bill. Companies Amendment Number 3 Bill 2020, Clause 1, Short Titling Commencement, Clause 2, Amendment of Section 2 of the Companies Law 2020 Revision, Definition and inter Interpretation, Clause 3, Amendment of Section 26A, Registrar to Provide Information, Clause 4, Amendment of Section 41, Annual List of Members and Return of Capital, shares, calls, etc. Clause 5, repeal and substitution of Part 15, custody, etc. of bearer shares. Clause 6, amendment of Section 245, application. Clause 7, amendment of Section 279A, request for additional information. Question is that clauses one through to seven do stand part of the bill. 
All in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clauses 1 to 7 stands part of the bill. New Clause 6A, Amendment of Section 263, Disclosure of Beneficial Ownership, Information by the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority. Minister of Financial Services. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In accordance with the provisions of Standing Order 52, 1 and 2, I, the Honorable Tara Rivers, the Minister responsible for Financial Services and Home Affairs, give notice to move the following amendments to the company's amendment number three bill 2020. That the bill be amended by inserting after clause six, the following clause. Amendment of sections 263, disclosure of beneficial ownership information by the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority. 6A, the principal law is amended in section 263 by repealing subsection one and substituting the following subsection. One, notwithstanding sub section 245.1, the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority may, on the request of a competent authority, disclose any information, A, relating to a company or a subsidiary of a company which is exempt from this part pursuant to sections 245.1, B, C, E, or F, and B, that the company or subsidiary which is exempt from this part pursuant to sections 245, 1, B, C, E, or F would be required to provide under this part as required particulars if this part applied to that company or subsidiary. New Clause 6A, Amendment of Section 263, Disclosure of Beneficial Ownership, Information by the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority. The new Clause 6A have been read a first time. The question is that the clause be read a second time. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The clause is deemed to have been read a second time. The minister wishing to speak further? Uh, no, Mr. Speaker. The question is now that the clause be added to the bill as clause number 6A and that the clauses, as you understand, will be renumbered accordingly. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 6A is added to the bill. A bill for a law to amend the company's law 2020 revision to include the customs and border control services to the list of entities which may require information from the registrar. To repeal sections of the law relating to bearer shares, to address references to the list of To address references to the list of equivalent jurisdictions published under the Anti-Money Laundering Regulations 2020 revision to require companies to maintain and file with the registrar information on the nature of its business and for incidental and connected purposes. Question is that the title do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, the ayes have it. The title stands part of the bill.
Properties Miscellaneous Provisions, Amendment Bill 2020, Clause 1, short title. Question is that the short title do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The short title do stand part of the bill. Clause 1, do stand part of the bill. Clause 2, Amendment of Section 8 of the Property Miscellaneous Provisions Law 2017 Revision, deeds and certain other instruments no longer required to be executed under seal. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In accordance with the provisions of Standing Order 52, 1 and 2, I, the Honorable Tara Rivers, the Minister responsible for Financial Services and Home Affairs, give notice to move the following amendment to the Property Miscellaneous Provisions Amendment Bill 2020. That the bill be amended in Clause 2 as follows. A, in paragraph A, in the proposed subsection 4AA as follows. One, in subparagraph 2, by deleting the words, quote, contemporaneously, semicolon, and, end quote, and substituting the words, quote, contemporaneously, period, end quote, and two, by deleting subparagraph three. In paragraph B, by deleting the word, quote, and, end quote, at the end of the paragraph. In paragraph C, by deleting the full stop at the end of the paragraph and substituting the words, quote, semicolon, and, end quote, and by inserting after paragraph C, the following paragraph, D, by inserting after subsection 6, the following subsection. 7. The Cabinet may make regulations providing for such matters as may be necessary for giving effect to subsection 4A. Is the Minister speaking further? No, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chair. If question is that amendment stand part of the clause. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against? You. The ayes have it. The clause as amended stands part of the bill. The question is now that clause two as Clause 2, as amended, stands part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against? Ayes uh, have it. Clause 2, as amended, stands part of the bill. You didn't want to talk. A bill for a law to amend the property. Miscellaneous provision, law 2017 revision, to provide for the virtual witnesses, witnessing and ask station as required. Signatures for the execution of a deed or instrument under seal and for incidental and connected purposes. Question is that the title do stands part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The title do now stands part of the bill. Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill 2020, Clause 1, short title. Question is that short. Question is that the title do stand. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. All. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. 
Clause two, amendment of section two of the Special Economic Zones Law 2017 revision definitions. Honorable the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in accordance with the provisions of Standing Order 52, 1 and 2, I, Alden McLaughlin, Premier, give notice to move the following amendments to the Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill 2020. That the bill be amended in Clause 2B in Paragraph E of the definition of the word controller by deleting the word accustomed and substituting, therefore, the words legally required. Amendment has been moved, is the Premier speaking? No, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is, is there any other member wish to speak? The Leader of the Opposition? If not, the question is that clause as amended stands part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Question now is that clause two as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 2, as amended, stands part of the bill. Clause 3, Amendment of Section 3, Establishment of the Special Economic Zone Authority. Question is that Clause 3 do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 3 stands part of the bill. Clause 4, Amendment of Section 5, Functions of the Authority. Honorable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the bill be amended in Clause 4B in the proposed subsection 5, subsection 5, by inserting after the words subsection 3, the words, unless the recipient is bound by a statutory duty of confidentiality in relation to the information received. The amendment has been moved. Is the Premier speaking? No, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman. Question is, Clause 4. That the clause? Clause 4B. No, no. The question is that amendment stands part of the clause. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The question is that clause two as amend, sorry, clause four as amended stands part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clause four as amended stands part of the bill. Clause five, amendment of section six, powers of the authority. Honorable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the bill be amended in Clause 5 as follows. A, in the proposed Section 6, 1B, A, by deleting paragraph A and substituting, therefore, the following paragraph. A, the authorities function of one, examining and processing applications with respect to the approval and refusal of applications for renewal. And two, amending the applicant's trade certificate in accordance with section 23 of the law. And B, in the proposed section 6, 1D, by deleting the words matter or thing. The amendment has been moved. Is the Premier speaking? No, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? If not, the question is that amendment stands part of the clause. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against, the ayes have it. The question is that clause five was amended, stands part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, 
The Ayes have it. Clause 5 was amended. Stands part of the bill. Clause 6, insertion of Section 6A, additional powers of the authority. Clause 7, repeal of Section 11, special economic zone deemed to be outside of the islands. Clause 8, amendment of Section 14, application for trade certificate. Clause 9, amendment of Section 16, grant or refusal of trade certificate. Question is that clauses 6, through to nine, do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clauses six through to nine now stands part of the bill. Clause 10, amendment of section 18, benefits of special economic zone, enterprise and conditions. Honorable Premier. Mrs. Chairman, I beg to move that the bill be amended by deleting clauses 10 and 11 and substituting, therefore, the following clause. Amendment to Section 18, Benefits of Special Economic Zone, Enterprise and Conditions. 10, the principal law is amended in Section 18 by inserting after subsection 1 the following subsection, 1A. A special economic zone enterprise shall comply with all laws in force in the islands, notwithstanding the benefits referred to in subsection 1 and any other exceptions specified in this law. Question is that clause 10 be amended. The amendment stands part of the clause. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The question now is that clauses, clause 10, as amended, stands part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 10, as amended, stands part of the bill. Clause 11, amendment of section 23. Amendment to trade certificate. I, I thought that the um, Premier moved that Clause 11 be deleted. Yeah, there's, no, there's no Clause 11 now. We are now at um, Clause 12. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Premier, I think you, you look, need to look at at the bill itself. 11 is there and I know that. I mean there is no further amendment to 11. Yeah, that's what I've already done. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the Premier moved the motion to delete. Clauses 10, yes, it, yes. 10 and 11. Specifically 11. Specifically 11, am I right? I just don't want to say. The bill. The motion that, that has just passed, Mr. Speak, Mr. Chairman, is that the bill be amended by deleting clauses 10 and 11. Question is that clause 11 now be de deleted. All those in favor, please say aye. Mr. Speak, Mr. Chairman, we've already voted on that. No. The, the motion that I moved and that, that, the, that was carried by the committee is that the bill be amended by deleting clauses 10 and 11. So we don't need to go over that again. The next amendment, Mr. Chairman, is amendment to clause 12. 
Yes, we know that there is a proposed amendment there, but I need to get straight, clear clarity on clause 10 and 11. Clause 10, so your motion was that clauses 10 and 11 be deleted? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, do you not have a copy of yes, the um, committee stage amendment? Mm -hmm. Clause 12, insertion of 24A, notification of material changes. The Premier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move that the bill be amended in Clause 12 by inserting after the word enterprise the words upon paying the prescribed amendment fee specified in Section 23. Amendment has been moved. Is the Premier speaking? No, thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Does another member wish to speak? The question is that the clause as, a, as amended stands part, the, the amendment stands part of the clause. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it, the amendment stands part of the clause. The question is that clause 12, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 12, as amended, stands part of the bill. Clause 13, amendment of section 26, suspension or revocation of trade certificate. Question is that clause 13 do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye, aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 13 as amended stand, sorry. Clause 13 do stand part of the bill. Clause 14, insertion of section 29C, annual return. Do you have Honorable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I beg to move that the bill be amended by deleting clause 14 and substituting the following clause. Insertion of section 29C, annual return, as a heading 14. The principal law is amended by inserting after section 29B the following section, headed annual return, 29C, 1. A special economic zone enterprise shall submit an annual return to the authority on or before the 31st day of January of every year, and the annual return shall accompany the prescribed annual fee specified in Section 22.2 of the law, unless otherwise prescribed by regulations made under subsection 2. 2. The annual return referred to in subsection 1 shall be submitted in the form and in the manner prescribed by regulations made by the Cabinet. Amendment has been moved. Is the Premier speaking? No, oh, thank you, sir. Does another member wish to speak? The question is that the amendment stands part of the clause. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The question now is that Clause 14, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clause 14, as amended, stands part of the bill. Clause 15, Amendment of Section 30, Regulations. Question is that Clause 15 do now stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Start clause 15, do stand part of the bill. 
a bill for a law to amend the Special Economic Zones Law 2017 revision to provide for anti-money laundering and counterterrorism and proliferation financing requirements and for incidental and connected purposes. Question is that the title do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The title now stands part of the bill. Mr. Chairman, there's one more amendment. It's simply to do with the renumbering of the clauses. No, we gave AG. The AG that, that's fine then, okay. Yes, the AG has that right. permission to. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Premier. Penal Code Amendment Number Two, Bill 2020, Clause One, Short Title, Clause Two, Insertion of New Section 186A, 186B in the Penal Code 2019 Revision, Suicide to Cease to Be a Crime, Criminal Liability for Competency in a Person's Suicide. Question is that clauses one and two do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clauses one and two stands part of the bill. A bill for a law to amend the Penal Code 2019 revision to decriminalize suicide and to introduce criminal liability for comp comp complicity and a person's suicide and for incidental and connected purposes. Question is that the title do now stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye, aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The title now stands part of the bill. Health care. Mr. 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 Chair, before you get to the health care decision amendment bill, would you leave? Um, during the debate, the Honourable Member from Northside had suggested that I might want to have a look at the amendment as it relates to euthanasia. I have since spoken to him and showed him a provision in Section 41 of the Healthcare Decision Bill, and he is content that it addresses his concerns. Yes, sir? Yeah. Member from Northside? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'm satisfied with the explanation given by the Honorable Attorney General. Thank you. So there are no amendments? Thank God. Health Care <coughs> Decisions Amendment Bill 2020, Clause 1, Citation and Commencement. Clause 2, Amendment of Section 2 of the Health Care Decisions Law. 2019 interpretation. Question is that clauses one and two do stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Clauses one and two now stands part of the bill. A bill for a law to amend the health care decisions law 2019 to define assisted suicide and euthanasia in light of amendments made to the Penal Code 2019 revision to decriminalize suicide and for incidental and connected purposes. Question is that the title do now stand part of the bill. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, the ayes have it. The title do now stand part of the bill.
The bills will be reported to the Honourable House. All those in favour? Those against? As have it, the bills will be reported to the Honourable House. Please be seated. The House is now in session. Report on bills. Private funding of legal services bill 2020. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to report that the bill with the short title Private Funding of Legal Services Bill 2020 was considered by a committee of the whole house. Sorry, was considered by a committee of the parliament, entire parliament, and passed with amendments. The bill has been duly reported and is set down for the third reading. Virtual Asset Service Providers, Amendment Bill 2020. The Honorable the Minister of Financial Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am to report that a committee of the entire parliament has considered the bill shortly entitled the Virtual Asset Service Providers, Amendment Bill 2020, and it was passed without amendment. The bill has been duly reported and is set down for the third reading. Companies Amendment Number 3, Bill 2020. The Honourable Minister of Financial Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am to report that a committee of the entire parliament has considered the bill shortly entitled the Companies Amendment Number 3, Bill 2020, and it was passed with amendment. The bill has been duly reported and is now set down for the third reading. Property Miscellaneous Provisions Amendment Bill 2020. The Honourable Minister of Financial Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am to report that a committee of the entire parliament has considered the bill shortly entitled the Property Miscellaneous Provisions Amendment Bill 2020, and it was passed with amendment. Bill has been duly reported and is set down for the third reading. Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill 2020. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am to report that a bill shortly entitled the Special Economic Zones Amendment Bill 2020 was considered by a committee of the whole House and was passed with amendment. The bill has been duly reported and is now set down for the third reading. Penal Code Amendment Number 2, Bill 2020. The Honourable Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to report that the bill entitled Penal Code Amendment Number 2, Bill 2020 was considered by the Committee of Parliament and passed without amendment. The bill has been duly reported. It is now set down for the third reading. Healthcare Decisions Amendment Bill 2020. The Honourable the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to report that the Healthcare Decision Bill, sorry, the Healthcare Decision Amendment Bill 2020 was considered by a committee of parliament and passed, entire parliament, sorry, and passed without amendments. The bill has been duly reported. It's now set down for the third reading. The Honourable the Premier.
No, we, 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 we take the adjournment. I thought that was agreed. Mr. Speaker, I'm I'm in the hands of of members, but I am ready to proceed. I can I can go ahead. Mr. Speaker, can I have two members standing at once? <laughs> um, honourable members, we we are not doing the um, any for the business on the bills. Do, do you want to go into the motions, government motions, we would follow next? I have to look at what, and understand what the majority wants. Yeah, but you're the minority. Mr. Speaker, there, there seems to be some um, some reservation about proceeding so further today. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't mind at all. Um, I move the adjournment of dishonorable house until 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning. The question is that dishonorable house to stand adjourned until 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning next. All in favor? Aye. Those against? No. The ayes have it. This Honorable House now stands adjourned until Wednesday next, God willing.